Now I want to welcome on, he is a friend of the pod, a listener of the pod, a fellow Missouri Tiger, and he works in product development at Stanley Black & Decker, Jackson Davis. Wow. This is a dream come true, having you on the podcast. Thank you. Welcome. This is just awesome. Mike, you are too kind. Uh, I know you've had this dream in your head since you were a little boy of age 24. Um, <laughs> But we're pumped to be here. No, dude, I'm excited. Like, congratulations, first of all. Like, Thank this you. is a really cool show. This is a really cool thing. Hey, we're, we're just talking to a lot of fun people and, and really trying to figure out the format. So um, when, when you had kind of reached out and you're like, hey, you know, really love the pot. I was like, you know, let's, let's dial it up. Let's go have some fun. And I don't know yeah, where you, you want to You have no standards yet. You have no reason I, to be I, like- We like, have no standards. We, we invite anyone. Basically, we'll do anything for content. That's really the motto of the show, uh, or at least the unofficial one. So- uh, this is just a blast, um, but I don't know where you want to start. We can give a little background of, of, you know, why we're friends, you know, the Mizzou thing. We can start there if you want. Otherwise, I, I just, there's a whole lot of things that we have to catch up on and, and I want to talk to you about. Yeah, I, let's, tell, let's tell them the tale. So we met, um, was that fall of 2016 or was that fall of 2020? I think it was 2015, 2015. 2015, yeah. 2015. Yeah. We, were, uh, we were fraternity brothers. We, we, met, were. we we were big frat boys. Uh, <laughs> As you can tell. My, I, I changed my name from Jackson. It was originally Chad. Uh, but yeah, we, <laughs> we met at, yeah, our fraternity, and we were quick to, we had a lot of common interests. We joined a lot yep. of similar organizations. Um, I do seem to remember getting to know you best through, um, well, your pledge father. Yes, yes. Was Justin. a really good was, yeah, was a really good friend of mine at the time. So we met through, through him and we just hit it off on our own accord and yep. everything just cascaded it, downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a ton of fun. We were uh, roommates for back-to-back -back formals, and, uh, which was incredible. Shout out Chicago and Memphis. I still have those playlists saved in my Spotify. I actually, I actually listened to one the other day. Oh, I because love you, it. Because you added 98% of the songs, and I was like, Mike had good taste. I'm just going to listen to this for a I, I, it's they, they bring me back. It brings me back to Chicago. It brings me back to Memphis. So we, we did that and, and had a lot of fun. But no, it, like you said, just, you know, fast friends, had a lot of similar interests. And here we both are post-grad as, as former Tigers, and we're chatting it up on a podcast. I feel like that's a kind of a, a, a very Mizzou thing, like we're both tigers and now we're on a podcast when you're yeah when your friend from journalism school at mizzou makes a podcast i think it's by i think it's state law that you have to be on it it is it is actually it's the like journalist creed that's the part that they add in like as a small little like kind of asterisk down there it's like and it's, you have to be a podcast guest it's in fine friends underneath the arch it is it is uh so no, mizzou, this is, this is exciting i'm, I'm really excited to to have you on for this we're gonna have a lot of fun um, I just, I, where do we want to start? I mean, the one thing that has been drawing, the one thing that's been getting my attention recently, and you did it, I think last week, you've been cooking a lot and you cooked Olive Garden breadsticks. I don't know if we want to start there. Uh, there's just, we have a lot to cover. So I, let's, let's get to the cooking first, maybe, because the cooking content has been just off the charts. You know what it was? And now that, like we're both postgrads, we can talk about that. Like, yes, it was the, the intense desire I moved when I graduated, I moved to a I moved to Austin, Texas, and I didn't know a single solitary soul. And when you go to a college where you can't walk down the sidewalk without mm -hmm. knowing everybody, yep, you suddenly find yourself really unoccupied. And the first few months of like moving there, I was working to make friends. I was like, I moved like you know in a weird time because it was like actually cold in Texas, so no yeah. one was there were no outdoor like events or anything to go meet people at. So I started picking up and I credit and I, I, I give him a good, if he listens to this, I'll shout him out. Uh, Benji with Babish, yep. uh, the YouTube star, he, mm -hmm. I, his stuff came across my like targeted Facebook feed and he made some dish that looked super fancy, but the video is yeah. like five yeah. minutes long and it made it super easy to make. And I was like, I bet I could do that. And I just wanted a hobby. I'm so used to making things with my hands as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And when you move into an apartment without a garage or a balcony to like craft without getting your entire apartment a mess, I just had no creative outlet for my hands. And suddenly it became cooking. Mm -hmm. And I'll, like, I didn't cook in college. I was awful at it. And I was super bad at it when I first started. But then I'm not, I won't even say I'm good now. 
I would say I'm up. I just post things and I think I'm good enough at taking a decent picture that all my friends think I'm good. Uh, <laughs> I think you're, I don't know. I think you're rock solid. I click on your story and I'm like, oh my goodness. I like, I look down at like the Chinese food I ordered that day and I'm like, Jackson is making a, like a strawberry reduction filet mignon or something like that. Something just like that looks incredible. I'm like, wow. It, it might, it might've been the pork chop with uh, orange and apple citrus sauce. Like yes, that, that was be. delicious. That one was actually good, but no, it's, uh, it's funny because I'll start making those videos because like some of the stuff takes a freaking long time to make. Yeah. And I'll start at like, like on a weekend, on a Sunday, I'll start at like 3.30, like making dough for pasta. And like, it's a good chunk of friends on Instagram who are like, oh, I love this. Like, oh, it looks so cool. It looks so neat. And then a good chunk of friends, like probably like, I think those are the, the friends that humble me. Because they're just like, you're doing too much. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's three, it's 3.30. You're not even hungry yet. Just order Domino's when you get there. Like, you don't need yeah. to do all this. I'm like, I know I don't, but what else will I do? Well, I, I think it's like you said, you know, you, and I got to give you a shout out here. You know, you just one of, I think the most incredible creators of things you've done uh, a homecoming float. You've done, I think three homecoming floats. I've lost track of how many homecoming floats you've made. You've three homecoming floats, um, like a, a, an alcohol beer cart, whatever you want to call it. Like just some of the most ornate, beautifully designed, you bars. know, stuff I've ever, bars I've ever <laughs> seen. Bar cart, that was, where, that was where I was looking for. Bar cart, just some of the, the most in incredible stuff. Where does that, and then obviously now you've moved it into food. Where does that come from? Like just out of curiosity, where, where does that, where did that start? I, you know, so I, I don't get asked that. I get asked that more than I think I should get asked that mainly because like, I don't know if they're just trying to be nice or if they're just like, why are you the way you are? Um, <laughs> my... My family is all sports people, like 1,000% mm -hmm. sports people. And I love them for that. But I was not yeah. at all. I tried every sport. I wasn't terrible at them. I just didn't enjoy them. Um, not to say that they're not good. It was just mm -hmm. not my thing. Um, yeah. I'm not competitive like that. Well, what I was really good at was Legos. And I yep. only, yeah. if there was a Star Wars Lego set from years of uh, 2001, to 2011, I'll say 12, mm -hmm. I, I owned it. It nice. was like, they were my Christmas gifts, they were my birthday gifts, they were my Easter gifts, they were, uh, they were mom, please, 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 can I have it gifts? Mm -hmm. And after, I think around I was like 13, 14, you know, middle school people bully. And <laughs> I, you remember those times? I, I remember those times, yeah. I, I had a, a, a bowl cut right across, the top part of my yeah so I I, I know I'm, I'm aware oh, yeah. I got a lot of Harry Potter references for my for my hair but I, I was getting to the age where like Legos just seemed too I, I thought it was a kid's toy like now I know I could buy them as an adult and everyone's like oh cool like you bought Legos but like at the yeah. time I thought I couldn't do it anymore and so I started getting into other stuff like PVC pipe and like making weird cons I, I, I put a bunch of stuff at the Illinois State Fair um, sculpture contests because it was no longer like Lego sets. They were legit. Like I was building like eight foot tall things. Yeah. And my dad gave me a, he, he basically hollowed out half the garage and that became like my outdoor workspace. And so like freshman year of high school, I like everyone dressed up for Halloween and I really wanted to go all out. So I made an Iron Man suit out of sheet metal. Wow. Like wow. riveted and it lit like the hands lit up and everything. And as opposed to middle school where people would bully you for liking Legos as a big kid. I'm using air quotes for the pod, big kid. Uh, I wore this thing to high school and everyone was like, that's the coolest thing ever, dude. Oh my God, like, whoa, can I try it on? And suddenly it was like, oh, like, this is something I should be proud of. Like you learn to be proud of your, like sometimes you suppress the hobbies because you don't know that you wonder why you like it. But then yeah. people yeah. were encouraging me to do more. And so that kind of, that was around the time that I wanted to be an engineer or decided that I wanted to be an engineer. And I just, it, it went on from there. I did, I built sets for school plays. Um, there was one school play that like, they had bought a script from a Broadway show and it needed, mm -hmm. it needed a car. Like all the cool kids at the high school were gonna come in off stage on this car that had to roll around and actually work and actually have wheels. And, um, but they couldn't just buy like a Tonka truck at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> So they, so the, uh, 
theater guy, theater, what, what do you call them? Teachers. That's the one. Teachers. Yes. Uh, yeah. Teacher. The guy who teaches. He gave me like 200 bucks out of the school's budget and was like, if you, if I give this to you, will it work? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, but I'm going to try. Like, he, was, can't, yeah. he was like, okay. And so I made this Mercedes, this 1980s Mercedes SL convertible and it held five kids on it, like three in the back seat, two in the front. And it got pushed on stage and then they wheel it around and wheel it back off. And that was like my big, like, that was the first thing I ever did where like people were legit paying me. They didn't pay me, but like gave me yeah. money to build something for them. And uh, just, yeah, I think that, that was the genesis of it. Yeah. Well, I guess the kind of the, a, a follow up to that, you know, obviously with Legos, there was an instruction manual. It's, you know, we're going to take this piece and, and stick you know, this piece on that. And, and before you know, it, you've got like, you know, a Lego Millennium Falcon, you know, as you're moving into, you know, stuff like building a, a car for a theater production, there's not really a, like a manual, like, how did you learn all of that stuff on the fly? Was it a lot of like Googling YouTube type stuff or was it just a lot of trial and error? So it's honestly, here's the thing. I will praise Legos to no end. So Legos, yeah. Yes, they have an instruction manual. Yes, you have to put them together. And they, at the end, you get the result of whatever they told you to make. But in doing that, you realize how Lego, let's, so let's say the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Uh, they told you what pieces you could use to make the Millennium Falcon uh, circular shape. Mm -hmm. For the six people who aren't watching that don't know what Star Wars is, the Millennium Falcon is shaped like a big, like a big dish. Yeah. And they teach you how to use straight pieces to make a curve. And so you learn something from that. Like not only, yes, you followed instructions to get there, but now visually in your head, you know that if you want to make a circle, you can use a bunch of straight pieces to get there. And after a certain amount of time, you start taking those Lego sets apart. Like mm -hmm. I, I had to always fight with myself on what Lego sets I wanted to keep together to keep on the shelf and what Lego sets I wanted to tear apart to become something, uh, to become my own creation. Yeah, because I saw something that I thought was really cool, and there wasn't a Lego set for it yet. So I was like, I want to build it myself. Well, I know how to make that shape because I've made that shape in other things before. And it kind of gets down to that once you move into other building materials, and like it's the same thing with cooking. Mm -hmm. Cooking is just Lego pieces. Every vegetable is different Lego like piece, and if you know yeah. what the taste that you're getting from that is, and how to chop it up, and how long to cook it, then you might be following the recipe to make a certain dish. But then you go look in the kitchen and you see, oh, I've only got these ingredients. It's not enough to make this sandwich, but I know that these two go really well together. And if I do it with this, then that might go like, it, I've always made the mental analogy, like the more knowledge you have is the more stuff that you, like the more tools you have in your tool ship and just knowing what to pull out to do each thing. Yeah helps you figure things out. So that's kind of how, like, I would say Legos really, again, again, the genesis, because once you know what pieces you're working with and what you have, then you can just go walk around a hardware store. Okay, the goal's a car. All right, well, I need a Mercedes logo and some headlights. Let's go walk around. Oh, look, some, uh, some uh, plastic lamps. Yeah. Plastic lamp covers, there you go, bam. Okay, I need a wheel, but I don't wanna buy a wheel because those are actually really expensive. Oh, there's a trash can lid that I can cut a yeah. hole out of and make, there's your, there's your tire. Like you can That's so this. cool. We did, I mean, the same thing we did with homecoming floats. You remember you were there. Yeah. We just took junk and made it into other junk that like looked like something else. Why? Well, and then that's, first of all, like, I just think that is the coolest. And that's definitely going to be something we're going to have to clip and put on social media because it's, I, I think it's a, a really brilliant thought and a really kind of brilliant analogy to bring together. We just brought together Legos, construction, and cooking kind of all in, in one little mix. So it applies I, to love. It applies to love too, but I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> we'll have um, you on for that <laughs> podcast. We'll, we'll bring you back on when you crack that code. We're like, okay, here we go. Jackson Legos. Solved. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I, I think you're, I, you're right. It's, you know, you see, you start to pick up on patterns, you start to see things, you start to like, you kind of like go from, okay, now I'm just going to kind of copy this to now, you know, I'm going to change it a little bit, remix it to then you're starting to see your own stuff, but being able to do it really quickly with Legos and just absolutely kind of build and iterate through things. It, it does allow you then to when you are working with, you know, bigger pieces, you know, construction type parts, stuff you'd buy at a hardware store, you, those patterns that you've picked up on, you know, thousands of times, 
you now see it, you know, out in the wild and open and you, you have that pattern recognition almost built in, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word. No, no, it hundred percent is. And like in my job these days, I, I go talk to people who use tools every single day. And I've found that like, you can't hide natural talent. Like there's like, you will always know if someone has a natural talent, but I also meet these people that I wouldn't necessarily call creatives Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like, they aren't doing it for, they're creative. Don't get me wrong. I, when I think of creative person, I think of someone who does something for an artistic expression. Yeah. Um, There are some people who just love the challenge of like cabinet. Like I've met this cabinet maker and he, he was a gruff, very few words, man, but he, it wasn't that he was super creative and that by that, I mean, artistic, but he just got this simple joy. He was trained, but for, he's been doing this for 40 years and it started out as a, um, as a hobby for him, but the simple Mm -hmm. pleasure of like, once he got to a good enough stage that he knew what, like he had that right tool. He knew what was in his head to like do it properly, but then put your own spin on it. So then he went, he went into custom cabinetry because all custom cabinets have the same core, same structure. It's just how you implement them. Same thing. It's like a Lego. Every, the same building blocks are there, but you can put your own spin on it to make it whatever you want. And he just makes the most astounding stuff. And if you were to like compliment him on like his craftsmanship, he wouldn't even admit that he was a craftsman. He would tell him, he would tell you that it's just how it's, he legit told me it's like, it's how it's supposed to be done. Like, it's how you put these things together. I'm like, I know, but still, how'd your brain get to where you could put those things together? And I'm always, yeah. Involved. Like, even as someone who I claim to do it myself, like, I'm not there yet. And I won't be for 38 more years, but he, he's, it's that kind of stuff is incredible to me. I, I think it is. And, I, you know, from a kind of, I guess, a marketing standpoint, like, I, I would agree with you. It's kind of that old, kind of thought like we have, I think really high taste and we, you know, really know what looks well, but it it takes a lot of practice, takes a lot of pattern recognition, you know, to be able to now internalize what you're seeing, form it in your head and then, and then really go execute it at the end of the day, whether it's, you know, custom cabinetry or a really great, you know, a really great ad or an incredibly, you know, put together video or just even a, a really great set of Legos. I mean, that's, it takes practice, it takes iteration and it takes a lot of time to then internalize kind of all of that and then go out and execute it. A hundred, oh yeah, a hundred percent. It's like you're. It's a skill that you're never. I would never. I would never ever get to a stage where I say I'm perfect at it, mm-hmm. or even a master. I don't believe in that phrase anymore. Like I'll. I'm, I'll I'm right someone, there with you. I'll call someone a master craftsman all the time. Like I'm not sure I mean it, but like I'll. But if I were to say I've mastered something, like no, like that, someone needs to. Any if you if you're watching this right now, hearing this, if I ever call myself a master of anything. I will yeah. DM me. I will give you my address. Send me a Looney Tunes pie with like a boxing glove that comes out of it and just hits me yep. in the face. Yeah, just send me one of those because I'm lying or I'm drunk. <laughs> I I, I want to get kind of back to the the early days of of you building all this stuff. Do you have any kind of? I mean, you talked about the Iron Man suit as a moment where you're like, okay, like this is something that you know is is now some sort of a a skill that, that people are interested in. Do you have any kind of, you know, personal Eureka moment with all of this where you're like, Oh, like, shoot, I can do this. Like I can, I can move from now Legos to PVC to, you know, hardware. Is there any moment you look back on where you're like, okay, like I can do this. I, you know what? Okay. There's going to be one. So I mentioned, I, I used to uh, enter, I used to enter, the Illinois State Fair. Yes. And so for the first two years, I, well, I'm just, I'm just going to come out there. I got first place every year. Like, I'm just going to say it. But the first <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. I like it. You know, I, it's on my, it's on my hinge profile. Uh, <laughs> it's a bragging, right? The first year was a puppy that was made out of sheet metal. And I'm still proud of him to this day, but he looks like absolute garbage. I think it was just because a 12 year old entered the competition. They were like, Oh wow, this kid's got like for a 12 year old, this is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's next to like a painting of like a farm side. that's like absolutely stunning. They're like, well, <laughs> this 12 year old, he named the dog Sparky because it's made okay. out of metal. That's cute. It's original, trendy, cool. It's, yeah. Bless him. Bless his soul. Uh, the second year I fully ripped off. Do you remember the show? I Carly. Oh, of course. Yeah. Nickelodeon's I Carly. Do you remember that giant robot made out of soda bottles that was in the background of his apartment? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. 
So I replicated that. I absolutely plagiarized it, like full blown. I thought it was cool. I really wanted to have it. I thought it'd be so awesome to have in my house. Mm -hmm. Okay, my parents' house, they disagree. But <laughs> I, so I spent weeks, and I think it was about 60 bottles of Mountain Dew. Yeah. Two liter bottles of Mountain Dew, mind you, and I drank all of them. And that's what's wrong with me today. Um, but I built this thing, and I finished it, and I named it Mountain Dew Bot. And yeah. Dew Bot for short. And it, well, it got first place and it was awesome and it was seven feet tall, but like, I really just, again, like Legos, I had seen something that I wanted to make and I just made it. Mm -hmm. um, next year was coming up and I didn't know what to do. And we, I had recently discovered this process where you could take PVC pipe and mm -hmm. if you cut it and heat it up, you could actually flatten the tube into flat sheets. And okay. Then, and then you could cut those sheets and then use heat to form it to whatever shape you wanted to make. And I've been experimenting with that, trying to make another Iron Man suit um, that was more st uh, more structural than the one I had made because it was very thin sheet metal. It cut me while I was wearing it. Um, I walked into a pole in class because my helmet wasn't really good and it like oh, no. gave me like, it gave me a laceration on my forehead. So I was like, oh, let's do plastic. Like that's softer. I can I can bend it easier. And it goes together easier. And so I started doing that and I was getting good at it. And then about like halfway through Iron Man's torso, mm -hmm. I realized that it'd be way more cool to make something of my own idea for the state fair because the state fair was only a couple months away. Yeah. So I made a, it had my measurements, but it became way more muscular, a five foot 10 robot entirely made out of plastic it is um what did i name him i named him six pack because i actually going off of the mountain dew thing i took yeah. Six, yeah. i took a six pack of mountain dew and i shoved it in his abdomen and like that was his six pack that was his um, i love that but he was he was a hundred percent handcrafted uh there were no i didn't like take i didn't build an iron man i didn't build something that i'd already seen before um he had like he was fully animatronic in terms of like all of his joints, mm -hmm. where his shoulder was, his joint moved, his at like torso moved, hips, head, jaw, all of that. And he weighed about like, he weighed like 60 pounds. He was the size of me. You could put like my clothes on him. He was, um, it was just like, and when I was finished, you know, like I was literally sitting there, I'm looking at him like, I just made this entirely by myself, like from scratch, no, like it was just pure creativity. And like, I would have drawings of what I wanted it to look like, but then I would go into the shop and sometimes things would just kind of, like I would bend it wrong and be like, oh, I like that look. Or halfway through making it, I was like, oh, I got a better idea. And you would just change it right then and there. So it wasn't me staring at a picture of something and being like, oh, well, if this is six inches, then I've got to make mine six inches. Like it was legit just my thing. And yeah. Yeah. after submitting that and it winning first place again and me keeping it hung, proud, hungly, hung, hungly. It's okay. Yeah. Proudly hung yep. in, yeah. my, uh, in my workshop that I now have, we, we moved houses and I then had like a full blown wood shop at the time. I was like, yeah, I'm creative. I could make things that don't exist already. Like at first I was just really good at making things that I'd seen, but this was the first time that I'd made something that people enjoyed, that I enjoyed making, that was my own thing. And it kind of gave me an idea that, okay, there are good ideas up in here. Like, I don't know how many, I don't know how long this will last. When will I tap it dry? But until then, yeah. That's incredible. That's, I, I absolutely love that story. And I, I the kind of the other additional part of, of this whole kind of thing that has stuck out to me is, you know, you said, you know, sports family growing up, you know, everyone loves sports, but your, your dad, you know, cleared a, a spot for you in the garage. What, you know, cause obviously like, you can get into your, you know, dad, you know, is, was an athletic director, I, I believe, or football coach. So like very sports, you know, oriented family, you know, what, you know, spurred him to clearing out a spot in the garage and then kind of how did, you know, his involvement or how did that kind of evolve throughout the years? You're building, you know, more intricate and, and just really cool stuff. My family uh, is, <laughs> uh, let's see. So for starters, 
Mm -hmm. Let's just, let's tell it in terms of a story. So yeah. dad starts out by clearing out half the garage for me. And um, we didn't have a lot of tools in the house. Like what, whatever we had was like what he needed. So like a saw, a hammer, mm -hmm. a crowbar. We didn't have like, we didn't have drills and specialized tools and things to like actually craft other things, just things to take stuff apart or to fix it when it broke. So um, we, my sister, my sister who's a little bit younger than me, she went to this dance class every Wednesday. And I vividly remember we were, this was when we were young, young. My mom, I would go with my mom. She would drop Alex off at this dance class. This dance class was an hour long. Mm -hmm. We were a 10 minute drive from Menards or for those of you who aren't from the Midwest, Lowe's. And <laughs> so she would drop her off drive me to Lowe's slash Menards. I would then have like 25 minutes to grab whatever PVC, whatever wire, whatever like scrap wood before I could drive to do whatever I wanted to do. And we would get that within reason. I wasn't like draining the bank there, but, and then every so often I would ask like, cause it's Menards, like a tool there is like, I, I work for a company that sells expensive tools now, but at Menards you can get a, I can get a reciprocating saw for 35 bucks, which is yeah. a lot to give a kid, but it's not, it doesn't break the bank. So like every month or so, I would ask for a new tool to, to help. And mom was more than generous enough to do it. And then I would take it home and my dad had this TV in the garage. And it was like, what I loved is that like my parent, none, neither of my parents knew what I was doing. They kind of just stared at a, after a while. They never knew, but they never not supported. So mm -hmm. mom would take me to Menards when Alex was at dance class, my sister. And then my dad would, when he would get off work, he would sit at this little bar, my first bar I ever made, uh, that him and I built together. And he would sit there and he would watch uh, whatever sport was on TV in the garage while I stood, in the, while I was over in the corner cutting and hammering and drilling away at whatever. And when we moved into the new home, there was this shed in the backyard that the owner had used for his mowing equipment for the yard. Well, instead of doing that, my dad just gave me the whole thing. Like gave me wow. the entire wow. space where I had like, I was on my own electricity. Um, I could build my own stuff. Like I could take up as much space as I wanted to because it was my space. And he would always like, whenever friends would come over, the first thing that he would do is he would take him to the garage and be like, yeah, this is what, ja this is what Jackson's working on. And you'd never know what it was because it, it didn't have the shape at the time. I could be like half of a leg and they would <laughs> they'd be like, oh, cute. But my dad was always so like interested in the fact that like it was coming out of my head. Not like blood or anything. It wasn't a disease. But it was, like, <laughs> he was always so interested of like what was happening because his brain yeah. didn't operate that way. The same way that my brain doesn't operate in a way that lets me understand literally anything about football. But yeah, so it's just like, it, it is, and it's taught me like, if I ever do have kids, it, it's taught me the fact that like, you don't need to tell them how to do it because they never taught, like I will admit, like I learned a lot emotionally and ethically and morally from my family about being a good person. And isn't that most important overall? Yeah. But when it comes yeah. to like my career, I didn't really learn much of anything building wise from them. I got my conversation skills from my mom and my dad who both equally excel in different aspects um but when it came to building stuff like they didn't tell me what to do and they didn't help me except for the most important thing they didn't hinder me mm -hmm. they were always there to help out even if they, they didn't know what they were doing to help me out yeah they did yeah. mom didn't know why i needed all that pvc i could i could explain it but she didn't know what it was for she just supported me enough and knew that it meant enough to me to get it for me and my dad didn't know what i was going to make in the space but he cleared out half a garage and it was a, it was a small garage. It didn't, we didn't have room to kill, but because they understood it was something that I was passionate about, they supported it, which that's the biggest thing. I mean, you don't have to know what your significant other or someone close to you does. Mm -hmm. You just have to not hinder them while they do it and be there occasionally for the support. And I think that's stronger than giving me lessons on how to use a saw or teaching me how plywood goes together. Like that's, I'll learn that eventually if you give me time and space to do it. And that's what they did. So. Wow. I love that. And I think you bring up a great point. It's, it's, you know, whatever, whatever you like, just go in that direction of the thing you like. And like you said, 
you know, there's not going to be a, you're not going to be like, well, today I'm going to learn, you know, how to put two pieces of plywood together. It's like, I'm just going to try to figure it out and I'm going to get there eventually. And then after doing it for a long enough time, you know, things start to connect and, and pieces start to go together. Literally in this case. Literally, literally. And I think that's one of the biggest things is like, I know I used to think I was like a quitter when I was a little kid because I did, like I said, I tried every sport and I wasn't necessarily terrible at it, but I didn't like them. And so I never played more than a season or two of cross country, soccer, baseball, mm -hmm. golf. I tried for a while. I never made it through any of them for too long. I thought it was because I just couldn't, I thought I was a quitter. I thought I couldn't do it. And after finding things that I actually was passionate about, like I, like I said, cooking, beginning, awful. I made things I made that were like literally brought me to tears and gave me food poisoning. And with building stuff, I've hurt myself on many occasions. I've spent a lot of money on things that I've cut wrong and have ruined and I've had to go buy it again. And I've made things for friends that I like was super proud of and they ended up not panning out or um, not being what they needed. And like, it didn't make me want to stop. It just made me want to do it again and this time improve upon it. So it's like, once you find it, it's really hard to quit it. Yeah. Which I'm pretty sure is also the like catchphrase of crack cocaine, but I just, <laughs> <laughs> morally, <laughs> this is the moral version. Uh, hey, well, that's definitely going to be, I, we need to like freeze that quote and just attribute it to you. Not the crack cocaine part, but like if you find it, it's, it's hard to quit it. And I think it's, I think that range true, you know, no matter what you're doing, whether it's, you know, building stuff or marketing or podcast, whatever, once you find it and you feel that it's, you know, something where you want to come back to it every day, you know, then that means you're like, okay, I, I think I'm onto something here. I think, I think I figured something out. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that's, I'm like, it's fun like that. Nice. Well, I, I want to kind of get into your, as we're kind of, you know, moving throughout a bunch of things. I want to get into what you're doing right now, because, you know, of all the people who I've seen, you know, bring together what they're, what they love and what they're good at, you know, with something that people are going to pay you for, I, I put you right at the top of the list. I mean, you've, you've been able to, you've been able to find something that you like and that you enjoy that, you know, intersects with what, you know, someone is going to pay you for. So give me a little bit of background, kind of how you got here. And then also, we got a shout out, you know, the big yellow truck that you used to drive as well. Tell, we, give us. We got a shout out, Wally. Um, so I, I got a job. That's the story. That's the story. Uh, hey. <laughs> and, and, that, and that is it. Thank you everyone for listening Thank to the you podcast. Everyone for subscribing. This was brought to you by Squarespace. Um, no. So yeah. So I, our company, Stanley Black & Decker, world's largest power tool company, uh, for those of you that care. Um, owns and operates uh, many brands that I'm sure people have heard of. You may not know the name, but you've definitely heard of DeWalt, Craftsman, Porter Cable, Stanley, Black & Decker, um, other brands that I'm currently forgetting. Irwin, if you've ever used a vice grip or a screwdriver, mm -hmm. Irwin. Um, we just make, we make so much stuff. And they were at Mizzou, our alma mater, for a recruitment event. And it was a sales and marketing development program. And basically what it did is if you would go out in the field to learn how to sell tools out in the field. So field marketing. So go to Home Depot and um, do an event and merchandise a display and try to sell that way. And if you do that for a little bit, then they then you can move other where, other where, other places in the company based on what you, your skills you identified during that time. Because you do yeah. a little bit of everything in the first job. And what I learned was, and I knew this, I'm like, I'm not aggressive. I'm the best sales I ever had were because I just was a geek and talked so much about the tool that like that other person got excited and bought the tool. Yeah. But if I had a quota to sell, I wouldn't do it. Like we, we were, we're a premium brand because we make really good contractor grade tools. So if I'm being told to make a certain amount of money in the day and a little old lady just wants a screwdriver so she can put some legs on a table and she's only going to use it once, like morally I can't do that. So I was like, I never sold that kind of way. I know I wasn't aggressive. So I knew I wasn't going to go into like more sales roles. But what I was really good at was when new tools would come in, I would memorize their stats and like I would tell people how those help in their everyday lives and how those can really, again, be a tool, be an asset. Every tool is a solution to somebody's problem. So it's all about finding whatever tool is best for you. The good news is my company makes a lot of tools that I think help a lot of people. And so it wasn't really hard to sell that stuff because I just, 
had the Rolodex of tools. I was like, oh, you've got this problem. Here's 13 different options to help you. And while you're doing that, you're also getting ideas of like, oh, well, I heard that this, this customer is complaining about, um, this customer wishes that this drill had a little holder for your bits or mm -hmm. this handle was on this side because like I'm a right-handed person and it doesn't work that well if you're holding it at this angle. And I'm like, oh, well, that's really good feedback. Like that's something that we can use. So I went in for my promotion to do product marketing, which mm -hmm. um, is kind of the intersection of brand engineering um, sales because you obviously want the tools to do well, but and you take care of the products that you have under your portfolio that are already out in the world, making sure they sell well through promotions. If if a tool is not doing too well, you can um, maybe put a promotion out where it's price is lower by 20 bucks to get people to incentivize it to buy it like classic marketing stuff yeah but a huge part of our role is um new product development and that's taking like that's going out there through both online surveys and just word of mouth and just listening to people and see what the people need and then you get together with a group of engineers and you guys brainstorm prototypes that you think can work. Of course, like we got a business is always involved in this. It has to be fiscally responsible and it has to eventually mm -hmm. the company money is capitalism. But, but that's like, that's like such a back of the brain thing while you're doing it. And so we'll develop these prototypes and we will take them out and test them with real people. Like we won't just like, I, I, like I said, I know how to use tools, but I am not an expert. Like I could hold it and I could give my initial, assessment yeah. that doesn't stop there because if there's a the and i'm sure mike you know oxo brand good grips yes I, I think i've heard of them yeah yeah we uh the the company who makes cooking tools their their motto and the whole reason that they got the good grips line was they were trying to make a, the most ergonomic set of tools for the kitchen that you could use because mm -hmm. they were thinking of people with arthritis and if if grandma can't hold a potato peeler yep then she's not going to like, she can't, that's her livelihood is cooking like or, yeah. or eating to live. Like she's got to be able to use this tool. So OXO decided if I can make it for them, we can make it for everyone. Totally. So you can't just say, all right, this one guy says it's good, move on. So we go through a really extensive, um, I, I call it like, I, forget, I gave it an analogy one time, but it was stupid. So I'm just going to say like, it's, it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. We, put products out there. We have people test them. We hope that they break them. And then we go back and we do it again. And this is an iterative process that just keeps going and going and going until it doesn't break anymore. Mm -hmm. And at that point, then you get to decide, all right, we've got the foundation. Our stones are there. What else can we throw into it? Like, let's make it lighter. Let's make it faster. Let's make it. Um, and also like, what's the competition doing? You, like, yeah. you can't, like, yes, we're the biggest power tool company in the world, but you can't say that other people aren't doing a good job like there are some tools out there. there are tools that i own by competitors because they're we don't need like my company doesn't even have them yeah so you got to look at what they're doing too why did they do it the way they did is there some credence to that are we just copying them or are we improving something like imposter mm -hmm. syndrome is a real thing at all times um and after so long of doing that then you start to work with brand because you are the voice of like i always say we're the voice of the end user we yeah. know yeah. what people are going to be using that tool for. So we kind of, the engineers, of course, do, they build the tool. Like they're the main people behind it. But if they say, well, it can only do this much on a charge. Mm -hmm. And we say that the average user is going to use it for an extra two hours after that. Can we try to make it a little bit more aggressive? Yeah. Um, it's, it's an iterative process back and forth. We ask, we ask so much of them and they ask so much of us. And that's the team effort that gets it going. But then like after the product's basically been made, then we start to work with brand who, as you know, they're going to make all the content that goes in the websites, the awesome commercials that get people hooked, um, all the informational pamphlets about it and how it does it. And so we then help, I would, I will say like it's end user consultancy. Yeah. We're the people there who like for a commercial, if a user, if it looks really cool on camera that he, jumps out of his truck and takes it out of his toolbox and it's raining and you're like, well, yeah, but if, if it's, he's a roofer 
he's not going to be on the roof if it's raining. You probably shouldn't do that because everyone's going to be like, well, this commercial is totally fake. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to power tools, like you can, you can be really funny when it comes to like a beer commercial or a food commercial. Mm -hmm. But like when it comes to a power tool, literally you just have to show the tool doing its job really, really well. Because the user is going to take that with like, he's going to take that as gospel. If he saw it in a commercial, he's going to assume it does it in real life. Yeah. Like I think of that with car commercials all the time. Like you see them jump off a cliff. <laughs> you know yeah. they're kidding. You know they're kidding, but like you're like, oh, that must be a really tough car. Like we can't drop it. If we say that we're dropping it off of a two-story building and it's okay, mm -hmm. it has to be okay. So we only, so we're there kind of to make sure that creativity and a really good looking commercial isn't, um, doesn't dilute what the product can and can't do to keep it truthful and like to say like what a user is going to be looking for when he watches it. So I, I can, I remember this one time I was sitting, it literally was a half an hour process of me just doing the most mundane thing of like, we had a box of nails and it was in the back of a truck and I was like, hold on, that looks too staged. And so we went there and we just started tossing the nails into the truck yeah. Until, yeah. until it landed in a way that I was like, oh, that, that's, that looks accurate. And then we moved on. Like, but so it, it really, we're with the tools from, we're with the product from start to finish. And that's what I love so much about it. It's like, it's not like me helping with it for like a smidge and then passing it off. Like there are different times where other people in the company are in the driver's seat, but mm -hmm. I'm almost always in the passenger seat. Or like I'm almost always like drive, riding shotgun. Like I'm always one hand on the wheel in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Like someone else might be driving, but I'm definitely there, and that's what I kind of like about it, or not really love love about it. Um, wow, I'm probably getting off tangent. I have no clue what we were talking about. I know it's okay. no, it's I, I no, I, I think it's you bring up a you know an, an incredibly, I think it's you know relevant. I think is it especially you know as it comes to products, but you know, like you said, you guys, you know, have to be the voice of the end user because you know, with your customer that, you know, like you said, if you're showing, if this is something that's going to help with roofing, but you're showing someone up on a roof when it's raining outside, you can't do it. I mean, you just, it's, you're going to lose credibility. And I think paying attention to those small details when it comes to, you know, even something like showing how the product is displayed, showing how the nails should look in the back of a truck. I mean, they're all things that on the surface you think wouldn't matter, but they do. They, they matter a ton. And it, it, you know, so I, the way I always frame it up is someone won't be able to tell when it's right. Like subconsciously, they'll just kind of roll right over it if it's right, but they will 100% be able to tell if it's wrong. And, and that's why that's important. We see that a lot in our, um, I see that a lot in my, like just day to day. I, I religiously stock user reviews on mm -hmm. different websites and uh, Instagram to see like I follow a bunch of accounts to see like what these people are doing and there's always someone who's a know-it-all yeah there's always yeah. someone who like they didn't notice what the main part of it was they just noticed that one small thing that was wrong about it uh I can't mm -hmm. remember what the last one was oh it was it, no it was it, going back to roofing this we had a picture of this product on the roof and this was a real house. This, was a, this wasn't a set. This was, yeah. we went to a real location. This was a real home. And everyone's like in the comment section of this picture talking about this tool. They're like, how much does it cost? Oh, Bob, you need one of these for your house. And then some guy comes in and he's like, oh, those tiles aren't parallel. You're going to get water leakage in there. And I was like, he's like calling it out for being like a staged like set. And I was like, no, this was a real home. But for some reason, that was what he fixated on because that was what was yeah. wrong. And I just got peeved. I don't know why. I was like, because he wasn't focusing on the thing I wanted him to focus on or because I didn't notice it when I was on the roof too. But it was just like... <laughs> it's like one of those things you're like, of all the things that you're going to find in this post, it's and the of crooked all the tiles. To get, of all the things for me to get mad about, the things that yeah. peeve me off these days, I was never like that much of a perfectionist. And I, st I don't mm -hmm. still don't think I am. But like now I just see things that like... I'm like yeah the smallest thing and it irks me to no end i don't know what i, I just need to see a therapist <laughs> <laughs> well i we, we, i got a couple more questions for you because obviously it's it's getting late your time, so i got a couple more and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with some rapid fire what are some things that you've learned while kind of on on the job doing this because like you said it is such a a detail oriented thing it's such like one of those things where if a shingle is crooked you know someone is is going to point it out so you know, how have you kind of been able to refine that eye for detail and, and really what have you learned while being in this role? Because I imagine being able to pick up on 
just such small stuff like that. It, it takes practice. It does. Oh God, what have I learned? What have I learned? Um, I think the biggest takeaway that I've gotten from how long I've been with this job, which hasn't been long, it's been, it's been under a year, but the biggest takeaway I've gotten is I was very like independent in college, like I was, I was that guy in the group project who was like, eh, just give it to me. It's easier if I do it. Yeah. And now I'm in a work environment where like, it's not like you're interacting with a bunch of people in your same career field. I'm interacting with brand strategists and engineers and um, salesmen and, and contractors and all sorts of different likes of people all day long. So there are some things you have to hand off because it's just out of your realm. Like I'm not going to do the math on the tool. Like that's the engineer. Yeah. But there are also things that I think that I'm like, oh, I got this. That's a, that's a quick one. I can do that. Like it's faster if I do it. And then I hand it over and it's not what they were wanting, not mm -hmm. what they expected because I didn't, again, like you can get like your attention to detail can be there, but you can also interpret things differently. Yeah. And if you do it in conjunction, if like three people just to put a report together and you say, it's easier if I do it, just give me your data and I'll put it into the report that might misconstrue it because they had different ideas of how they were going to represent the data. Yeah. So I don't know how I can phrase it in a way that's like succinct, but basically it's like every person per perceives things differently. And sometimes you may think that you're tailoring to your audience, but in reality you're doing the exact opposite. So having the most eyes you can get on something to make sure that your message is clear mm -hmm. is, is vital. I don't think I've ever submitted anything for a long, I, I have, like, I don't think for a while now, I haven't submitted something without having at least two, three people look over it, just to make sure I'm like, hey, what are you interpreting out of this report? Are we all on the same page? Because when I send this off, yeah, it's gonna be gospel, and I can't have it be not, I can't have it be misinterpreted any other way. So the key to clarity is repetition. Uh, that doesn't make sense. The key to, the key to clarity is, love teamwork i like you get you get it you get i it. get it no i i totally it's it. it's a lot of people you know you can only kind of get better by you know first of all seeking feedback but then getting different feedback from different people because someone may look at it a certain way and you know if you're able to get it from three people and kind of triangulate like okay like as long as i'm within you know the xyz boundaries of whatever this was supposed to look like you know as you know kind of seen through the feedback of these three folks you know then the majority of people are going to get it there, there's not going to be a, a miss you know, a, a misperception of it or, or anything of, like that. No. Yep. 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 Cool. Well, I got, I got one more. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I, I gotta say you've had more great quotes, I think in this, this one pod than, than I think all the other ones combined. There's, there's been some really great stuff here. So you, you nice boy, <laughs> <laughs> you, you sweet, sweet man. <laughs> oh, I, I got one more question and we'll, we'll jump into the rapid fire. Cause I'm, I'm excited for that, but I'm you, terrified. I have no idea what it is. I, we don't really have a name for it. We just call it the rapid fire. It's not really a rapid fire. It's not really rapid, nor is it anything else. It's just like five random questions, I guess. Um, right. But anyway, it's like the last question before we get into that is you've, you've had like, a, I think just, a, you know, as an outsider looking and I, I think a really cool path, you know, to getting where you are because you've built it, you've started to build it. Wow, that's really bad grammar. Um, you built a lot of things and, and you kind of were self-taught in that regard, you know, we're an engineer at Mizzou and then ended in business, you know, and, and obviously did an incredible job at that. And then you went into kind of sales and, and drove around in a, a yellow truck. Um, oh yeah. We didn't even mention Wally. Yeah. So also, we, sorry okay. guys, I had this big yellow truck. It was a big yellow F-150 with DeWalt written down the side. So I called it DeWalter um, or Wally for short. Yep. And it was my favorite thing on the planet because I stepped out of it. And that yep. was the most <laughs> ironic thing. I would pull up in a parking lot and I would step out and everyone would look at me and be like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Did you steal this? Like, like who? <laughs> yeah. So sorry. Sorry. So question. So, so <laughs> you've, you've, you've kind of had just, like I said, I think, you know, from an outsider looking at just a really cool path, you've, you know, done all this stuff. You were driving a, a giant yellow truck around um, the, the greater Austin area. And then now you're kind Walter. of RIP to Walter. And then now you're working in this role where, you know, you're, you're involved in the development of products and, and really doing what you love. So, you know, what, what kind of advice, takeaway thoughts, you know, because 
obviously those aren't dots you can connect in the moment, but you know, looking back, you're like, okay, like I, I, I kind of get it. What advice do you have for people who, you know, either are following a similar path or, or just maybe follow like working on a winding path right now, so to speak. I don't know. Oh, you're good. Uh, I don't think I'm qualified to give advice. Um, okay. I'm not qualified to give advice people because I don't, I'm really good at giving advice, but I'm not good at taking it. So I'm not going to tell you to do something because it's probably, I probably didn't do it. I'll just tell you what I did do. I, so I knew that this job that I currently have could be accessed through the job that I did. It was very clear in the tree that was like in the pamphlet when I applied for the job, like, here's where you can go afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that was an option, but I knew that after a while, the job I was going to be in was going to strain me and not like just in terms of monotony, in terms of being like, I felt overqualified at times, not by like any sort of yeah, and yeah, vanity. Yeah, I thought I was too good for it sometimes, but I also was just like, wow, I graduated. I should be making this much at this stage. Like, I got in my head a lot. I also have a lot of really, 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 really successful friends, and social media was painful. And I would watch them be moving to these high rises in Chicago and like be traveling Europe, and they get these internships that would be like, my my only internship I ever had was back in my hometown, which I loved it. I really thought it was great, but it wasn't glamorous. And I was living in this beautiful city, but I wasn't doing what I seemed to be a glamorous job. And like, I, but I knew I would get there eventually if I just like stuck up with it because like, yeah, you want to do these things and you want to do them now. But like, there are sometimes like, I'm only 26. I've only been doing this since I was 24. Like a lot has happened to me in two years and you, you think you get a job and you're gonna be stuck with it forever. And, or mm -hmm. if, you don't, if you don't lay your chess pieces perfectly, then you're not gonna end up where you wanna be. But I just, I got the job offer. I put in, I put in cities when I applied in, to, in college, I put in cities that I wanted to live in. And Austin wasn't even on the list. I had done Chicago, Kansas City, and Minneapolis because I knew people in each one of those cities. So no matter where I moved, I would have friends outside of college. And then they offered me Austin, Texas. And I was like, well, I mean, I can't say no, but I, I also looked up Austin and saw how beautiful it was and how much fun it looked like a city. And so I was like, you know, let's just, fine, let's do it. Like I just signed, I have, I have a really good, I have a really good bad habit of just saying like, yeah, let's do it. Like not to like crazy shit. Like again, like not like heroin. We keep bringing yeah. up heroin, but like, <laughs> Not we, I, that's my bad. No, it's um, okay. But we, I have this bad habit of just like, if it, and I do this at work too, like getting handed tasks that I don't think I can do. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I have this weird sense of confidence where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing right now, but I know that at the end it's all going to work out. And I applied that to Texas. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew that in the end it would all work out. I just kept saying that. And yeah. if I said, you manifested enough times that then, then I finally did get the job offer. I did move here. I still don't know. I, I still moved to a city where I don't know a soul. Like Baltimore. If, if you're from Baltimore and you're listening, like, hey, ask, Jack. Mike, ask Mike for my number. We can get coffee when we're all wearing, like, when we're all outside and don't have to yeah. mask. Yeah. But I just have this bad habit of telling myself that everything's going to be okay. So why not go ahead and do it anyway? Mm -hmm. Um. Am I a hundred percent right? I don't think I am because like things always like yeah things have gone wrong and but they also have like not gone too wrong. I don't just jump off cliffs. Yeah, totally. I, have a I have a parachute. Have I jumped off a cliff before? No, but I know I have a parachute. So let's just go ahead and try it. Yeah, and it's worked out so far. I'm I'm honestly gonna say like I have no regrets like, and I have no sage advice about like oh well if I had known this I would have done this differently like honestly no because I didn't know it so why pretend that I did yeah why not just yeah. go do it learn from it say you learned it later and as long as you can say you learned something at the end of it like then it wasn't a wasted opportunity wow I maybe that, I don't know I don't no, know. I, I I love that I, I think you're right there's you know just give it a shot and like you said whether you you know you're going to learn something whether it goes really well or really poorly or somewhere in between something's going to happen. You're going to learn something and you're going to, odds are you're going to learn more from that feedback than you would 
you know, Googling it or, or searching it or, or trying to kind of figure out how other people are doing it. Like, just go give it a shot yeah. and see what happens. I've, I've, I, I looked at pathways to, to career fields in product development that I was like, and I learned, not learned, and I kind of figured, I guess I kind of learned, especially when, like, especially when you're 23, 24. Yeah. You have no experience and you have no experience. So the only way to get to where you want to be is to have a massively cool portfolio of products that you've developed, which you can only really do if you're in a product design school mm -hmm. and, or you're, or you're an entrepreneur and you were already making this stuff, which I didn't have the entrepreneurial spirit that you did. Like I took the same, like we, we you and I took similar classes, but I yeah. like, I never, they never clicked with me. I have no idea why. If you're a therapist in the listening, just feel free to psychoanalyze me. Tell me why I'm not aggressive. Um, but the, I was like, I'm with this. Oh yeah, I have no experience. So I have no clue. The only way to get the job is to graduate with that degree. But I graduated with a sales degree. Well, a marketing degree with, from the business yeah. school. So everyone thinks sales, which is accurate. So I went through sales, got that, like did what my job description said I was supposed to do then took a promotion within the company to go to products because now I knew people in the company. They knew me, my work ethic, my skill set. They, they relied on more than just my resume. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got to that new stage. And now my logic, like what, if you want my five-year plan, I don't know. I, I love this company. I'd still love to be here. But also now when my resume gets updated and I do go to look for other jobs, my resume says that yeah, I graduated with a business degree, but I did product development for the number one, for the world's largest power tool company. Yep. yep. I, that, I can say that I did product development. I didn't take the formal path. I didn't like do this internship, which led to this thing, which led to this thing. I kind of just looked at it in the sense of, you're, the, you're way better at convincing people about you than any piece of paper you're ever going to make. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And yeah, you need it to get in the door, but once you get in the door, you can sell them on yourself. Yeah. So just do this, um, do this job that's not fit for you until you get a job that is fit for you because uh, upward momentum, I'm just rambling at this stage, but yeah, it's no. like, that's, it's, yeah, you know. I think you, na you nailed it on the, I think you nailed it. I, I was going to say you, you hit the nail on the head, but that's probably a little too, you know. You know how many times you make that pun at work and how many times I'm the one that makes that pun? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad we could get it in then. I'm glad we could get it in the pod. Day. Hey, you hit, the nail, you hit the nail on the head, bud. And I'm just like, oh, God. Just a collective groan. Well, I, I yeah, I so think that's, sorry. I think w the whole thought there is, I think it's an excellent thought and I think you nailed it. And now I'm excited for the rapid fire. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm really pumped to kind of hear your answers to this. So are you ready to get started? I am. So what do we do? Okay. So I'm just going to ask you kind of five questions and whether you answer them rapidly or not, it, it doesn't matter, but they're just going to kind of be just different kind of questions. All right. So I kind of go, I kind of go AK 47 speed or uh, a revolutionary bayonet speed. Exactly. And exactly. How fast I fire. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. That, that's a really good analogy. I like that. So first question, you're having people over for dinner. What are you cooking for them? What's your go-to? Do you ask everyone this question or is it just because of, just because I'm here? Uh, well, we, we tailor them to people too. So that, this is okay. more of a, this is more of a specific you question. All right. So for me, it is, uh, I, I, I think about this often. Um, I really love a good steak, mm -hmm. but that is so, it's so over the top sometimes. Like it, it, it doesn't like if, if I'm having just anyone over, like if I'm just having friends over, um, I have this real quick recipe for this pasta dish, um, that it's like takes 10 minutes to make. I know everyone loves it. And then um, like you just chop up, like it's, you make ratatouille. Everyone hears ratatouille. Oh, cool. That was the first dish I ever learned to make. You think it's super fancy, but you just chop up some eggplant, some uh, zucchini squash, um, some tomatoes, some onions, uh, some bell peppers. You, you stew it all in a pot. Like if you have an hour to get it going and it, it cause it, in the movie, it looks like a fancy dish. That's actually confit bialdi, which is like roasted vegetable slices. Actual ratatouille is like more of a gumbo. Gotcha. So you, know, like you serve a pasta dish with these roasted, like this roasted veggie soup on the side. Uh, and then enough wine to where no one remembers how bad the dish actually was. <laughs> 
Okay, so you're one for one. I, I love that, and I love the, the French cuisine reference in there. Oh, and tiramisu. That's like the best dessert ever. If you don't like tiramisu, you're... <laughs> I, I, you're, not coming up, you're not coming over for dinner. Like, sorry. <laughs> you, you aced it. Okay, this next one, I'm really interested to get your take on. What is your, and this is definitely, all of them are kind of tailored to the guests, but what is your favorite power tool? Oh, all right. My favorite power tool. All right. So my childhood, mm -hmm. that's, this is a really tough question. I'm really mad at you for this actually. <laughs> okay. So my favorite power tool that I use these days for my own personal projects is a oscillating tool. Gotcha. Basically what happens is it, it, the blade that is attached to it vibrates about one to two degrees in any direction, but it does it so rapidly that it, you, it's safe to touch your fingers to the blade, but it can still cut through wood, metal, plastic, and you can buy any variety of blades for it. So once you buy this singular tool, mm -hmm. you can effectively, it can do the work of a saw, it can do the work of a drill, it can do the work of a scraper, of a sander, because you can buy those attachments for all of it. So I've been telling, like, I've, I've, a couple of friends of mine have bought houses now, and I'm like, if you really want to, like, get that. But this is not me selling a tool. Like, it, like Walt, yeah. the DCS 356, if anyone's wanting to buy it, but that's, I'm not selling that tool. It's just my favorite thing at the moment. My personal favorite tool yep. uh, is this really crappy pair of pliers, adjustable, adjustable jaw pliers. Gotcha. They are so coated in rust that I don't know what brand they are but they were my grandfather's who my dad gave them to me. And I didn't understand at the time. I was just like, yeah, oh, these are all like, I was just going through my dad's stores and be like, okay, what, what, what can open this thing? I didn't, mm -hmm. now, you know, like to appreciate a tool, but like I, at first I was just like, oh yeah, that'll, that'll fit. And I just use it as a hammer. Um, but it's my go-to it's in, it's in my toolbox. It's always like one of the first things I bring out because you, you can use it for so many different applications, but it's, um, on, especially because like you get to a stage uh, again this is not rapid fire but no it's once, okay once you love a hobby to a certain degree you get sentimental value imbued into certain things that you use so like a tool that i have associated like fond memories with either from it hurting me or from it being used a lot in a project that i love or memory of it being to my grandfather um a a new kitchen knife that mm -hmm. I like, like I have a knife now that I remember as being like the first expensive knife I ever bought that like I know how to sharpen myself. And like, it was like the sentimental thing of like, oh, this is a sign that I'm getting better at what I'm doing because I actually yeah. bought it. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think those are good. I love that. Okay. Next two are going to be Mizzou themed. So I'm just going to go ahead and prepare you for that. Um, RIP to piano. That's all I have to say. I, Sorry. Oh, well, hey, we have it's someone had to say it on the podcast. So this podcast uh, is sponsored to you by Dueling Piano Bar, uh, Penguin Dueling Piano Bar, Como, Missouri. Uh, there's a GoFundMe. There's a GoFundMe going around right now um, by a friend of mine uh, to save the bar. Nice. Uh, you can you can probably find it on Facebook. I, it might not do anything but all the proceeds are going to help um, the displaced employees from Penguin. So, so go donate. That's so the moral this of the story. actually technically did sponsor your podcast. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, I love it. Use, <laughs> use promo code uh, JAX, that's J-A-X at checkout um, to receive 10% off. I don't know. To receive 10% off your next drink. We'll figure something out. We'll work out a deal. 10% off your next donation. Like, your next donation. <laughs> AKA just donate 10% less. Just donate. Just give some cash. Uh, so this one, you're, you're in Como. What, what's your go-to food? What's your go-to food spot? Where are you going? Where's, where's the one? All right. Uh, I can't make a full-blown meal of it. So for lunch, it's going to be Pizza Tree. Cool. It's going to be the margarita or the truffle cremini from Pizza Love Tree. Love it. Love it. Undefeated. Uh, that's lunchtime because, you know, you never had, you didn't want to be, like, you always had somewhere to be. You had to get a quick slice. Yes. I don't know why I turned into an auctioneer just then, but, you know. <laughs> And then, uh, you, and you know it, Mike, you know it's coming. Yeah. There's no better place. Well, ah, oh, shoot. For, okay, oh. it's, well, it's easy. It's Ye Olde Heidelberg. It is, exactly. Okay, that's what I, that's what I was thinking you it's were going, yes. Ye Olde Heidelberg, because of the BOGO apps. Yep. The drink specials. Yep. 
uh, and more fondly, my memories associated with that place because it was one of the few restaurants where you could absolutely, like, especially when you're in college, like yeah. be, over, be over 21, but if you're in college and you want to get trashed, yeah. but you also <laughs> want to hear, you want to get trashed while talking to a group of your friends and you want to hear them while you're talking. You can't do yep. that at a club. You can't do that at a loud sports bar. So I just remember fondly being at a booth with like a group of friends for four or five hours being yep. very in pain the next morning, but loving like the memories associated with being there. And like the food also just happens to be amazing. It does. And then uh, if you're talking breakfast, we also know where that's going. It's going to have to be the diner. Diner's um, classic. Di classic diner. Uh, just, God, you cannot. You can't beat it, man. You, you can't beat it. You just can't beat it. I think about them five times a day, mainly because I follow the Twitter <laughs> accounts. But they are so I, good. It's so, it's so good. <laughs> That, oh man, I'm a little hungry right now. Like a little, I, uh, I could still go for some Marty's wings, man. You know At the how, Heidelberg. Oof. You know how like MSG is sprinkled into like all fast food to make it taste better. Yep. MSG is just ground up nostalgia. It is. It is. If I had like, if you mm -hmm. went and got like some of the Heidelberg, like yep. if you went and got like I don't know, like literally grind up a freaking Heidelberg glass. Yeah. Like, take one of their mugs and grind it up. Yep. Sprinkle that broken glass onto whatever I'm eating. Yeah. And I would just be like transported back. I would be like, this is. I, this is I got goosebumps just dead. thinking about it. You, also there's that. <laughs> <laughs> but it'd be nostalgic. It'd be nostalgic. I'd be nostalgic. I'd be like, this tastes like Marty's wings. Oh, this tastes like. Uh, 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 the loaded, potato skins. Loaded, loaded potato skin. Deluxe oh. loaded skins. So good. Ugh. So All right. good. Okay. Before I cry. Before I cry. Uh, next one. Favorite Mizzou tradition. I'm not legally allowed to say, <laughs> but I do really, I mean, it's got to be homecoming. It is. I, I would say yes. I, I think homecoming is the number have you, one. Have you come back to Mizzou since graduating? No, I was hoping to this year, but I don't know what it's going to look like. So maybe not. I, I think I speak for everyone in the room. You and me. Mm -hmm. uh, you and me. <laughs> Us too, yeah. I loved homecoming. Like I, you, you remember, I, we, we loved homecoming when we were actually there. Yep. Um, but going back and like going home. It's the best. Getting on an airplane, listening to songs that I listened to in college. My sister, so I, small, small tangent. My sister still it. went to, she went to Mizzou when I graduated, like after I graduated. She mm -hmm. picked me up from the St. Louis airport and drove me and my friend to Como. Yeah, and we entered the city lines. Mm -hmm. We got to like we got to this state of just like pure. But we were just pointing out shitty apartment buildings and yep. like I remember when so and so had a party there. Oh, I remember going over here. Like we were just reminiscing about. And she's like, "You guys are off the rails." And then she, <laughs> and then she graduated, and then she went back, and she was like sending me Snapchats of the most mundane stuff, like a park bench where we had a chat or like, mm -hmm. uh, or like a Lowry Mall by the library. And she's like, it's so good to be home. Like, now you know what I mean. Exactly. Going home was such a pure nostalgic feeling. It just hurt my soul like to leave. It literally, I, I lump in my throat as the plane took off. Oh. I, 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 you're right. I, you know, I hope, I don't know what homecoming looks like this year. You know, my goal would be to go back, but if not, it's, I think it would be just uh, out of control next year. I'd be so- It looks in. like we're going to lose. Well, I think we play Vanderbilt. We know, we, or wait, do we play someone else? Uh oh. I thought isn't Vanderbilt very good? Yeah, well, I, I guess they beat us. They beat us last year, so. I gave my, I gave my big. I that was the best attempt I was ever going to give at like being t talking sports with you, and I just. <laughs> no, that was that was Sports Minute brought to you by. No, that was our that was open mic Sports second. Minute Sports that Second. Was sports uh, second. <laughs> okay, so last like, ball. <laughs> <laughs> so last question. You're someone who I, I always look to for any kind of streaming, movie, TV show advice. I consider you a, a connoisseur of, of really great TV and movies. What's been your favorite watch while in quarantine? I really wish I, I so quarantine has caused me to watch so much stuff that I've had to like actually make a list of things. Yep. Um, HBO's The Watchmen. Oh, so good. Okay, you've seen it. All right. Um, yeah. Hulu's, Hulu's uh, The Great, about Catherine the Great. I haven't seen that. Okay, that's very good. Um, I just watched 
it took me a second, but I just like, it's been out for a while, that Netflix documentary, Don't Fuck With Cats. I haven't seen that one yet, but I hear that's that good. That was insane. That was actually scary. It's okay. very good. Spooky. Um, currently watching, uh, I have HBO Max, so I've been watching like uh, Lovecraft Country. Love that. I've been all about Lovecraft. Lovecraft. Okay, it's so, been okay. lights out. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. Um, I really, I really have been watching it. Um, uh, let's see on Netflix. There was, oh, uh, Umbrella Academy. I haven't seen that one yet. I got to get onto that one. Two seasons. That one's very good. If you like Lovecraft Country, you'll love Umbrella Academy. Okay. I'll add that to the list. And then, um, I mean, of course, The Mandalorian, of course, uh, I re- I'm probably rewatching Hamilton once, like once a week. <laughs> been I've been there too. I'm like, you know what? I got a couple hours to kill. Like, let's just let's run it back. You know, I I know the soundtrack. I know what's. Ha- I don't have to watch this. I just want to listen to the music while I'm like exactly. So yeah. Okay, those uh, are all. I think that's it. I think like, that's all I want to get into because the rest are just guilty, like like disgusting television. So I well, I, those those are excellent picks. You've aced the rapid fire. Uh, five for five. Perfect five for five. Um, <laughs> I it's lights out and you know more than anything Jax I, I just I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast this was I was just smiling the entire time because like there's just so much cool stuff that was talked about just awesome to talk to you in general and catch up so you, uh, this has just been incredible you 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 I no, Mike this is I, I love that you're doing this this is great I had a blast my throat's dry because I think you let me go way too long no, it's okay. Um, there are no yeah. limits. This is open mic. There, there well, are no, basically no rules. You can also edit a very large amount of this. <laughs> <laughs> you also hold that power. So I don't, you're like, it's fine. Keep going. I'll just cut the bad stuff. No. <laughs> but no, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I do hope to see you very soon in this life. Of course. Of course. Yep. You'll be, me, you'll you be as well. The, you'll be on the East Coast. I'm on the East Coast. Let's, gotta dial something up let's get some dunkin donuts talk about it talk talk about we can get some crab cakes in baltimore we could get some crab cakes we can do other stuff that the east coasters do i think yep. they like i've been here for 10 months i think they like they like old bay seasoning yep they like using their horn for everything except notifying you of danger <laughs> um they also like I mean, honestly, they just love talking, but like about absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. They'll yep. just start, they'll just, it's like, it's, it's worse than like, we're from the, it's worse than the Midwest. Yeah. They'll just start, they'll just There's start talking. Moments. But it's like about them screaming about like the color of something. Mm-hmm. Like, why is that blue? I'm like, I don't know. It's called the sky. Get out of my, <laughs> get out of my airspace. Like, <laughs> No, hey, I'm, we, we'll do something. We're, we'll dial something we'll, up. We'll get, we'll get you up to Boston while I'm up there. I don't know if you've been up to Boston. We'll do something. We got, no, we'll dial I'm, something up. I'm dying to discover the Declaration of Independence. Well, that's in Philadelphia. So they, you, when they went to Boston for stuff, didn't they? They did. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got... Uh, yeah, they, they followed some clues. Oh, yes. There was, there's a lot in Boston. There, there's a lot of old timey. There's one part where you're in like this kind of city, downtown Boston area. And then there's like the old, like kind of, uh, meeting area where the Boston massacre was. So you have like high rise fidelity building, all of this. And then it's like old timey building, like right there. Old timey murder swamp. Old timey, old timey murder swamp. Um, and then you got Fenway and a lot of other stuff. So we'll do something. Well, yeah. Once you're, once you're back in action, once the world is no longer on fire, which yes, is usually once it's a pile of ash, but we'll see if we can do that. <sighs> but we'll this has been lovely. Up. This has been well, lovely. We can't, I, I can't say thanks enough. This has been awesome and I'm looking forward to having you on again. No, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Nice, man, nice. Jack. You've, you've been listening to Open Mic with Mike Carlson.